Welcome to the Time Bubble Podcast, the only podcast where the guests get to travel in time. And this week is a very special episode because I've got my first international guest. Joining us by live satellite link up from New York, it's Carver Mike. Welcome. Thank you, sir. So, Mike, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a uh, software engineer by trade, born and raised in New York City, the son of immigrants. And I found myself uh, politically homeless a few years ago. And uh, you know, I had been a had been a lefty, had been an angry young black man, so you know, very much you know, progressive, revolutionary type of type of thing. And um, I ended up starting something called the Foundationist Society, uh, and we can talk more about that later. But basically, it's it's a it's a home for the politically homeless. It's a uh, you know, we're trying to change the way people think about themselves and and how they reason about themselves and the world, and and kind of get at questions of politics and society that way. So that's, uh, that's who I am. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people who feel that way to be quite honest. And well, certainly in this country as well, particularly the last, uh, two or three years, um, in that both of the main parties that govern this country, uh, sort of taking it in turn seem to be actively singing from the same hymn sheet and following the same, ideologies that many people here just you know don't feel comfortable with and there is no real alternative um politically uh and i think a lot of people are sort of out there looking for for other ideas yes sir um th- we have the same problem here uh there's you know the 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 political divisions we have i mean there are Political divisions, you can say whether people think they're fake or not, but the, but the point is that the political divisions we have don't accurately represent the real divisions in society. And I mean, I think that's what politics is for, right? Politics is supposed to be divisive if the divisions it represents are honest. And the problem is that the, that the divisions represented by our politics are simply not honest. They're not, they're not real. They don't go all the way down to the, to, you know, to, to what's really happening to us. And, and that, that's a big problem. Yeah, uh, it, it certainly is. Anyway, um, moving on from that, because we could talk about that for hours. But, <laughs> yes, we um, so uh, moving on to, to lighter things, I know you've listened to at least one episode of this, so you know roughly what to expect. But for the benefit of anybody new, uh, what we do on this podcast is give our guests the opportunity to travel back in time within their own lives and to visit other places and people in time and talk about those times and what they'd like to do. So the first question I'm going to ask you, and in fact, the first three questions I'm going to ask you are, if you could go back to any day within your life and live it over again, where would you go? So I think there's probably a couple of days that are tied. Uh, uh, You know, uh, certainly the, I think the day I first picked up a guitar (laughs) <laughs> the the day I first I first uh, decided I was going to learn how to play that instrument. Um, so how how old were you then? Jeez, I was. Um, I guess I must have been f- uh, 15, 14 or fifteen, something like that. Yeah, that sounds about the sort of age when many of us start to imagine that we want to be a rock star. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Um, and I think maybe. Um, I guess it was the day I, uh, you know, when, when I finished, I built my first recording studio back in 1999. Uh, and I think the day I finished, the day I actually lit up the studio for the first time and kind of did an end to end test and realized I had a real thing on my hands. Um, that'd be another day that, that, that would be cool to, to relive. Okay. So how, what's the time gap between, Picking up the guitar and building the studio. A fair uh, few years. Then. Yeah, that was that was uh, that was maybe uh, yeah, that was over a decade. That was um, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, something like so, yeah, something like a decade, I guess. Right? Okay. Yeah. So 
let's think about the, the day you, you picked up the guitar. So I'm guessing we're talking roughly late 80s. Yeah. Uh, so what? Um, who were your big influences then, the, the artists that you admired and followed? Well, uh, it's funny. Back then, I had a weird uh, uh, kind of musical experience growing up before I left home because I listened to a lot of funk and R and B, uh, you know, in, in New York, those days, uh, there was a, there was a, a radio station called WBLS. And, uh, so I listened to a lot of, a lot of, a lot of the stuff on that. I remember there's this DJ named Frankie Crocker that everyone really liked. And then, but I also used to listen to country, country and Western music. And believe it or not, in New York City in the 1970s, there was a country music station. It was called WHN. It was an AM station. And I had an AM radio in my room. And, you know, I used to go to sleep at night listening to country music. So, you know, uh, Johnny Cash, Amy Lou Harris, uh, you know, Don Williams, you know, Waylon Jennings, cats like that. Uh, and I think when, when I, um, I was really into, I was really into James Taylor at the time I, um, at the time I started playing guitar, but then I was also into, you know, stuff you wouldn't associate with a, uh, with acoustic guitar. You know, there's a lot of like interesting new wave music, synthesizer music. I remember really liking Howard Jones and Thomas Dolby. Um, so it just, I had a weird musical experience growing up. Yeah. I think that's probably true of most of us. It's a sort of hybrid of all sorts of different influences in a yeah. lot of cases. I mean, you do get some people that are very, sort of dedicated to one genre which you you could very much see back in in the 1980s when you could see by the sort of clothes people wore or what their hair was like you know uh, oh that's a, you know that's a heavy metal fan right 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 quite, <laughs> yeah. quite, um and the music scene generally uh just as in new york um over here was was really thriving yeah. Uh, when I was growing up and there were all these different genres of music sort of developing and coming along and it was a, a, a real mi mishmash of, of different stuff. And I, I think people of our era were inspired by that. In a way, perhaps I feel that they aren't these days. Yeah, I think that's right. Well, there was much more, you know, there's much more cross fertilization, right? It's like it, the, the, it's, it's almost like the musical tribes were well defined, right? But people yeah. would, would hop genres and would, would borrow from each other all the time, right? I mean, uh, you know, at, at, you know, speaking as a New York kid, m most of the stuff we thought was really cool music wise was coming from over there at the time. I mean, the eighties, like just, all the really, really cool stuff was coming from the UK. I mean, you know, everything from, you know, Shriek back to, uh, you know, again, uh, Thomas Dolby to, yeah. uh, you know, The Cure. I mean, you name it. It's like just, just all that stuff was, and, 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 um, there was a lot more experimentation. And you could hear too in the music, like when people, when people, when certain bands got into, hey, we're going to start using synthesizers. And, and like you could hear, them learning to use it and integrating that and and then hip-hop became a thing rap became a thing and like every other every other every, every other pop song had a rap in it <laughs> you know like yeah um so it was just a very interesting time you know? yeah there was a lot of sampling and stuff that that went on i recall and people used to copy each other um i mean what you're saying about people putting stuff into songs you'd have a year or two where there'd be like a sound bite that would just show up in every song <laughs> so i think it was about 1988 there must have been half a dozen songs that had this i know you're gonna dig this <laughs> at the start of it and it just starts to become a complete cliche after a while yeah um but uh, yeah it was interesting about the the genres of music integrating because I, I was very into indie music well mm -hmm. still am yeah uh, in the 80s and there were a lot of these quite obscure indie bands that didn't really make any sort of major impact on on the charts but then they borrowed um particularly when the sort of the the dance scene and the acid house and uh, all that sort of stuff came in in the 80s 90s some of the indie bands sort of integrated the dance stuff into their music and and suddenly became quite successful because they were fusing the two genres so it was yeah. it was interesting times yeah yeah, definitely. 
Now, just before we move, I know we were going to talk about three days. So uh, what, what's your second day going to be the recording studio or, or is that sort of part of the first? Day? No, I think that was that the recording studio was was the second day, I think. OK, so tell us about the recording studio. Well, uh, I had been lucky enough to work in a startup company. You know, when I got into the software industry, I was lucky enough to work in a, in a startup company that uh that went ipo and because i would you know that, that actually issued issued stock and because i had been one of the first handful of engineers to work for the company i had a lot of stock options and so i cashed in my stock options and uh decided that i was gonna live my lifelong dream and build a recording studio so that's what i did yeah well there's far worse things to invest your money in than that is for sure <laughs> definitely i mean yeah. it's, it's funny because it wasn't it was it was a great adventure it wasn't a good investment i mean i didn't you know no, no. i didn't really make any money and i kind of you know uh lost my shirt doing it but i had a blast it was it was that was great fun just having a studio and and knowing knowing musicians and being able to invite people over and, and recording people's songs and kind of making things sound good for them uh it was just great. I loved it. I loved it. Do you still have it? Uh, I've rebuilt it in the place where ah. I live now. So I'm, and, and in fact, I'm sitting in my control room right now. Um, so yeah, it's and it, there's been, yeah, it, it's been a kind of tumultuous ride because I ended up leaving that place and putting up a lot of my equipment in storage and what have you. So there's a, quite a long hiatus between um, between studios. I, I built another one in a different part of Brooklyn. Uh, years after that, um, and that didn't work out either. And now I'm now I'm here in in uh, in, in in the Bushwick section of Brooklyn, and I have yeah. kind of rebuilt and and I have a lot of the same equipment because uh, one of the things I did over the years was I kind of never, I never sold off my equipment. Um, I you know put put a lot of stuff in storage, got rid of a lot of other things, but I never sold off my equipment. So I've got some, I've got some stuff in here that's that's uh, that's pretty vintage. <laughs> Yeah, well, you, you do become very attached to to the equipment because uh, I used to do a fair bit of DJing yeah. sort of back yeah. in the in the noughties, um or the two thousands as I prefer to call it. I've never liked that phrase. The in the noughties. Stuff. but <laughs> but uh, that's an aside. I've got this Behringer amp, which I think probably cost me about four hundred pounds, and uh, you you know what it's like when, when you've got your amp and you take it out and. You know, uh, you've got all the little, all the dials, all the settings. It's it, uh, over the years you've perfected the perfect setup, and you just do not want to use anyone else's piece of equipment. That's right. That's and right. I, I haven't done uh, any DJ now for about ten years, but I've still got this amp down. It's in the sort of shed in the garden in storage, and mm. um, every year or so I have to go down there and, and sort of dust it off because there's spiders and, and stuff all over it and I, I, I get it out I get some old speakers out and it, it looks battered and you think oh it's not going to work anymore and every time it comes out crisp and clean and it's I'm never going to let that amp go even though I probably <laughs> won't ever use it again properly yeah so uh, how long did you take on it it probably took I want to say six months or so from the time I from the time I realized that I was going to do that, and um, you know I kind of started doing research and then buying equipment and what have you, um, yeah, I'd say maybe maybe about six months. Um, I, I, it, it was a solid month. A solid month of that was just wiring, just yeah. just build literally building cables. Um, and building wiring harnesses and, and, and kind of crouch down behind racks and, 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 you know, wiring things in. Uh, so yeah. But it's, it's such a, a fun thing to do, isn't it? To have a personal project. Yes. Uh, yes. Something that you're just doing for yourself. Um, not, you know, not with any sort of financial motivation, just the, the pure joy. I mean, you, you get these people that build these, um, you know, elaborate, train sets and models and the amount of time that people put into these things but uh, just for the sheer sheer joy of it yes that's right that's right i mean um i think i think part of the problem you know i mentioned politics earlier i think part of the problem with our politics is that we we're not people are people are looking for something to put themselves into like that to to obsess about right to geek out about and um i think but it's, not it's, always 
not always necessarily in a good way if they're that, jumping onto a um uh, whatever the latest bandwagon yeah, onto is. Onto a bandwagon, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's better to have something that you put yourself in that, that you love for its own sake, as opposed to you love it because it's an agenda that you. I mean, that's a separate thing. It's not. It's not that politics doesn't matter. It's that that's. It's not supposed to matter more than 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 these kind of fundamental things, you know. So, yeah. yeah, I think there's an increasing desire for people to feel part of something and accepted by some movement or any or or other, and perhaps they can't experience the simple joy of just doing something for themselves that well, they enjoy without having to perhaps tell the world about it or virtue signal to everybody about what they're doing and it, it certainly seems a a lot of that these days well yeah i mean i believe in i believe in masculine tribes is the thing like i really believe in in um and and in and, and in all of our communities, those of us who who uh you know who have either either been around long enough or who talk to elders, you know, it's like we know yeah. that it used to be that, you know, young men young men would, would maybe go and wrench on cars together at each other's house or you know, whatever, you know, th- this kind of like th- this, this kind of thing is important. And it's important for people to do that together, right? That is important. Um, I, you know, I believe in the individual, but I'm not a big fan of individualism. Um, I think that's part of the problem too. Like we need, and, and, and this whole point of political bandwagonism is a side effect of the fact that we've, we've forgotten that, that like we have to have these tribes. These tribes are important, Like they, they mean yeah. something. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, if it, even if it's you know uh, collective hobbies that people take part in, sports yes. clubs, and you know yes. we have groups of people that you know just like to go fishing or play golf, and uh, you know that, that these are things that you can do together that, that that don't have an agenda attached to them. That's right. That's right. And and they satisfy that. They scratch that itch, that tribal itch that we have. Um, yeah. and, and that's a very good thing because after all, we're social creatures. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't do any good to talk about, you know, do, do it, living for yourself or any, any of that nonsense. Um, we, we, we get stronger when we do things together. And the whole point of, uh, of these things like sports and hobbies and, you know, all these things that we've, the, these habits that we've evolved is they're a way for us to cooperate and to compete without having to actually fight and kill each other. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, so yeah. Yeah, well, you could say that's possibly why organized sport uh, took hold. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, what um, would you do, or where would you go for your third day? You know something? Yeah. The first time. So, I've I've had a weird life. Um, at a certain point, um, in the in the middle of the Great Recession. You know, housing crisis, two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Um, yeah, things got very bad, and and it it got it got so that um, uh, I, I wasn't able to find good work within my skill set as a software engineer. It was just not enough people were looking for people who had my skills. So okay. I kind of dropped out of the in- I, I dropped out of the industry, and I went to taxi school, and and learned how to drive um taxis and i got my yellow taxi license and so the first the first day the first day i went to um the cab company um and and got behind the wheel of a cab (laughs) that was that was um i was so happy just to have something that i could do to make money and kind of it was more or less on my own terms even though it was with someone else's equipment yeah, that was that was that was a very interesting day. That was that was yeah, that was cool. I mean, I was driving around New York in a yellow cab, <laughs> you know, behind the wheel yeah. of the yellow cab. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I suppose the equivalent for us would be the the, the London black cabs. Oh Jesus, so we we used to talk about yeah. you guys a lot in class because you know you, when you go to taxi school, and I went to the one I went to is is, is in a part of Queens called Long Island City. Um, yeah. You know, basically, you have to. You know, we we have to take an exam to 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 get the uh, the license from TLC, and so you have to know uh, the city, you have to know Manhattan, you have to know the Central Park crossings, you have to know the water crossings, you have to know the major arteries, right, of of New York City, the five boroughs, right, and um, 
the, our instructor had this photographic memory where he, he literally drew maps of New York City on the blackboard from memory. And he would talk about all the major arteries and what have you. And he talked about the English, the, the English cabbies. And he said the, the London cabbies. And he said, those guys are next level because there's so many more streets over there and in, in, in London. And it's there's no grid system at all. I mean, at least most of Manhattan is kind of like a grid. But you guys, it's, it's amazing um, that, that, that people yeah. can remember that stuff. Yeah. Uh, the the thing they have here is is called the knowledge. The knowledge, yeah, the, the knowledge, knowledge. <laughs> and it's quite incredible what they have to to pass. Um, I don't know whether it's the same. Uh, well, obviously you've got your black cab drivers, but there's obviously Uber now, and I, I would imagine that they probably just use sat navs. Yeah, well, what's funny was that at the, I don't know what the rules are now, but back when I um, back when I took my exam, uh, you were not allowed to use a GPS behind a GPS unit behind the wheel of a yellow cab. Um, I, I don't know about the, the, what they call the FHVs, um, you know, for hire vehicles, uh, that you call a service for. Um, and I, I, I know that Uber, Uber guys use GPS all the time, but TLC was very specific about yellow cabs. They didn't want you watching television behind the wheel. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, they wanted you looking at the street and avoiding accidents. Um, and that was maybe the most important thing they taught us at, 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 at cabby school was like, you, you, you are up when you get behind that wheel, you are a professional accident avoider. That is your first job. Um, so I, I don't, um, I, yeah, you know, yeah, GPS is, is a great instrument, but I don't, I don't like this thing of people having to be looking at a screen, um, while they're supposed to be paying attention to the road. Um, so, no, I quite agree. Um, so how, how long did you do that for? Oh, maybe like a year or so. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, and yeah. then you went back to your old career. Yeah, eventually, what happened was um, that there was there was a gap, you know. Um, but yes, what happened was uh, the, the um, how can I say? Um, slowly, the market began to heat up again. Uh, there began to be there started to be good jobs again in in the industry, uh, you know, specifically pertaining to my skill sets. And, um, yeah, it, it, it got to where it was, it was actually worth my while not to drive a cab. Um, yeah. and you know, the, the, the other thing was, I think the one reason I, I'd, uh, one reason I'd pick that day, that, that time to go back to is because, uh, in retrospect, I could have, I could have made a lot more money if I had done the smart thing and maybe like, Ask my folks to lend me enough money to, to, to rent a cab for one week. You see, because the way it used to work was you, you, you would show up at the, at, at the taxi stand at, uh, you know, like at maybe 4 a.m. for what they called stand up. And if you showed up early enough and there weren't too many guys on the line, then you would get yourself a cab. Um, but some, t some days you'd go and there would be no cabs for you. And uh, the guys who you were really able to make money had what's called a steady cab. They they paid in advance to, to rent a cab for the day shift or the night shift for an entire week. And so then you didn't have to, uh, you know, you didn't have to worry about showing up early enough to get a cab. You know that you had a cab there waiting for you. Oh, well, yeah. I, I didn't know that it worked like that. That's interesting. Yeah, that, that that's the way it works in in in, uh, in New York City. New York City's got a weird system. You know, we've got this medallion thing, and and there are people who have who have, have individual medallions, and and that that gives you the right to drive a cab to drive to drive this car as a cab. And then there are fleet medallion owners who have a medallion that covers you know two dozen cars or however many. Um. So so uh. Yeah, that, that's the way it was when I was driving. Again, the whole Uber thing has really changed the landscape. Um, but, uh, it was, it was, it was a very interesting thing to be a part of. Yeah. An enjoyable sort of year, sabbatical or so from your, your main career. Something different to do for a while. Yes. Yes. And, and, and you got to, you know, I got to talk to a lot of people and, and, uh, it, it was, yeah, you, you're kind of sampling people's lives just a little bit. And, um, it was that that was that was a lot of fun and then um and then just just the adventure of driving around the city you know um in yeah. what in in in, a, in an old ass crown victoria with bald tires uh <laughs> that was a that was an adventure in itself um 
I ended up, I ended up driving all the snow days when a lot of other guys didn't come to work. I'd come in on the Muslim holidays. I'd come in because all the Muslim drive, a lot of Muslim drivers and they all stayed home, but I'd come in so you could get a better car because there were, there were fewer drivers competing for that pool of cars. Um, and yeah, had a lot of adventures <laughs> on the streets. It was cool. So presumably now, if you were given some random address in New York, you, you'd still be able to get there. You remembered it all. Or? Uh, depending on where it is, <laughs> it's like in, in in Manhattan, yes. In Brooklyn, yes, a little less so. In the Bronx, that's a whole different story. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Well, let's move on to the second part of the podcast. Uh, this is slightly different. The next question. It's if you could choose somebody from history who you'd like to go back and spend a day in their shoes, who would you pick? Yeah. Now this question, I mean, I, I, I still can't narrow it down to, to, to fewer than three people, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, I remember you had a short list. Yeah. So. Yeah. And my top three would have to be Booker T. Washington, um, Watt Tyler and Father John Ball. Okay, we could we could talk about all of them. Um, perhaps we should talk about Watt Tyler and Father John Ball because obviously um, they are connected because they're from the same time. So, um, what do you admire about them? Well, you know, Watt Tyler, uh, Watt Tyler simply stood up for himself as a man, right? Um, he led he led a revolt that was specifically not not a not a resentment based revolution right you know we got a lot of people running around calling themselves revolutionaries you got a lot of people talking about burning it all down and doing all this business but but a lot of that is just resentment a lot of that isn't yeah. isn't any kind of real deep tribal association with other people who are in your class right who who come from who are your people but his thing was he 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 st- he stood up primarily for his family because basically, as I understand the story, some tax collector came and, uh, you know, disrespected the person of his wife, the physical person of his wife or his daughter or something like that. And and um, and what came and put the hammer down on him, <laughs> literally, you know. Yeah. And 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 that was the beginning. And that's uh, I think that that is um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, like if you if you have that, if you have men, if you have men who are willing to do that then you have a shot at having an actual civilization. Otherwise, yes. you're just a slave state. That's the way I see it. So um, yeah, it, 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 it was specifically not that he coveted the things that wealthy men had. In fact, I remember reading about how, um, you know, of course, they sacked a couple of castles and they, and, and they, and they beheaded a, a, a handful of officials. They sprang Father John Ball out of jail, you know, but... Um, I seem to recall that at one point he chastised people who were actually robbing some stately home somewhere because he was like, listen, we're not, we're not here for the, we're not here, you know, for thievery, right? We're not here to take what they have. We're here to insist that what we have is what we have. You know yes. what I'm saying? And I, and I found that very impressive. Um, because, because resentment, I think is, is, is a resentment is one of those primary sins. That, that, that always that always lands you in in hot water. This wasn't about resentment. This was like you know something. Uh, you, you've pushed us too far, so now we're going to push back. You know. And then Father Ball, Fa- Father John Ball, I think was was the I like him a lot because. Well, one, you know, it's it's funny as a Black American, you hear, you hear a lot of people talk about, of course, Martin Luther King. That's like the big figure. Um, People talk a little bit less about Malcolm X because he's 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 a uh, um, he, he's less of a they're, they're less comfortable addressing that side of things. You know, the idea that like you have to defend yourself. They like nonviolence. They don't like people standing up and saying, you know, <laughs> we're going to get into it. Um, but but no one to, people talk about Martin Luther King. No one talks about Martin Luther. And it seems yeah. to me that, you know, between uh, uh, Jan Hus and the Lollards and Martin Luther and Father John Ball, there's a real historical connection. And, and that also leads you to Martin Luther King. But no one talks about that whole tradition that Father John Ball was a part of. So again, th- this, this guy who really, he, he just talked about what, about, about the corruption in the system. That yes. was the thing. And 
I don't I don't look at him. I don't look at his ideas as being necessarily politically prescriptive. You know, it, it, it is not necessarily practical for us all to live in the way that Father John Ball suggested that we live in the way that the apostles lived. It's it's not practical unless we do it bottom up. It's not practical for a state to impose that. Right. You know, but I really like the fact that he was the spiritual head of this movement, that the movement itself understood that it needed a spiritual leader. Um, you know, and this this I, I can get into this a little bit. This is the, you know, those three figures, Booker T. Washington, Father John Ball, um, Watt Tyler represent these three archetypes that we're always talking about in the foundationist movement. Um, yeah, the, the 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 forge, the library, and the tower. So Father, uh, so Watt Tyler was the forge. He was a working man, the you know practical application. Booker T. Washington built a school. He represents the library uh, archetype, and then Father John Ball was a spiritual leader. He represents the tower archetype. So I'll pause there, but that's that, that's yeah. my three. Well, um, I'm quite interested in the story, of, you know, of Watt Tyler and Father John Ball and. What initially sparked all this off was the introduction of the poll tax, yes, as sir. it was was known, um, which uh, I believe was um, four pence for every uh, citizen, and it was something that was not affordable. I mean, the way I look at you, we're looking at the the fourteenth century here, which I think you'd probably agree was not one of the um, most uh, hospitable centuries of the last millennium to live in that you know they'd been through a, a lot of difficult times they'd had the black death you know a few yeah. a few years before uh and, and like you say they weren't weren't greedy they they were just standing up over what effectively was was the cost of living uh and you could draw parallels with with, with things that have happened since um, yes. It was interesting. Uh, we the, the the poll tax. It, it was talked about a lot um, back here uh, in 1990 when um, the, the government tried to bring in a thing called the community charge, which um, was dubbed the poll tax again by, yeah. by by the media, which which was effectively the same thing. Yeah. Uh, where the in our um, most households paid, I think it was called the rates at the time, or what we now call council tax. And instead of that, they they were trying to charge every single citizen the same thing. Uh, and I was, a, you know, a young man at the time, about uh, I think it's about nineteen or twenty when this came along. Uh, and suddenly, you know, I was still living at home with my parents. I'd just started my first job, uh, and I was being hit with with this quite sizable bill that I was expected. Uh, to pay, and I think the big thing at the time was that every single person in the country had to pay the same. So, you know, yeah, yeah. whether you were uh, uh, you, you'd pay the same as a, a, a millionaire, uh, and that that in itself caused um, riots in London yeah. that, that year. It's hard it, uh, hard to compare that to what Tyler because what Tyler uh, uh, and, and their lives would have been so much harder. We can't even imagine you know, the the levels of poverty that people generally would have lived by in those days. Uh, but even in 1990, it was enough to spark people off. Yes. And I think if times are hard enough, then people will stand up for a cause. And it's it's quite interesting when you look at what's happening in the world today, um, where we probably live more pampered lives than ever. And the whole thing with the fuel prices uh both for petrol and for electric and gas are about to well to soar through the roof and it, you know it it looks as if the poorest in society will be completely unable to uh, afford uh to to live and it i'm wondering if we will see any sort of similar uprising once that becomes apparent or or perhaps not because i feel that people you know you talked about men being real men back in those days and i i think that perhaps most aren't anymore well i mean that's that's one way to look at it i i tend to think that first of all it's not i mean look english peasants it wasn't like english peasants had it that easy before 1381 as you pointed out right yeah um and they had had all types of 
uh, things up levies and taxes and, and, and what have you and strictures imposed on them yeah. um, by the nobility, the landed gentry and so on and so forth. Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not so sure that this was simply a matter of this tax not being affordable. I'm not sure that that is what did it. What, 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 what set the spark to the powder keg. I think that it, it was, it was about someone it was about some someone violating something sacred, right? It's like this tax collector came in there and he put his hands on Wat Tyler's family. That was yes. the thing, okay? And so, and this the reason I'm 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 making an issue about that is because we we I think we need to understand that that um, the material aspect of what's happening to us is one thing, but it's in a way that, that that's a separate matter from the spiritual aspect like this is a this is a it is a spiritual question what is a man okay what is a family okay in what way must you not interfere with a man in what ways must you not interfere with a family see see that's a moral question and, it is. and 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 so the thing of like how high should this tax be that's a that's a political question um, but uh, this, this was something much deeper. And I think that the, the real problem I have with, with, um, with, with us as a society and, and how we choose, how we don't respond to these outrages and we, and we could go on forever about the outrages is that we, we seem to think it's all about the material, like how much it's costing you. And, and we try to make it about numbers. Maybe that's because we live in an era where computing is, 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 is a big deal. And so everything is about numbers and measurement and, and metrics and so on and so forth. And I think all of that stuff is irrelevant. You have to have a, you have to have a fundamental conviction about what a human being is and, 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 and what, what you, when, and what your role as a citizen is or as a subject is and what the state must and must not do. And if you have that, then then everything else, you can work out everything else. But if you don't have that, or if you have it and the state chooses to disrespect it, then it's got to be a fight. Yeah, interesting. I think um, certainly I don't know as much about, you know, the, the story of what Tyler as uh, obviously as, as you do. And, you know, it's interesting to hearing more about the motivations behind it, because what we tend to be taught at school mm -hmm. uh, with the historical facts, uh, I mean, you, if you asked most people uh, what they know about the peasants' revolt, they would say they brought a new tax in, what Tyler led an uprising against the tax, and they stormed London, etc., yeah, etc. They simple. wouldn't, they wouldn't know yeah. about. They probably wouldn't know the detail about him, you know, about the official insulting his wife and and all of the. The, the the other undercurrents uh, what, beneath right. it all you, you what, just right. you just you just get to, you just get told the simple facts well, well that's right and, and uh, that's and without because, the context well that's right and the because the context is inconvenient because the yeah. context really is that the black death as i recall had had decimated the the european labor force okay and as a result the, the laborer in europe and in the uk was actually in a much better position he could negotiate for better for better pay. He was he was kind of yeah he he was he was uh, he was in a more commanding position because because good labor was was more scarce. Okay, you had fewer people to work the land, and and the government responded to that. Okay, by trying to put limits on how on on how free a man was to sell his labor to someone who wanted to buy his labor. Okay. Yeah. And and so 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 th there was already a lot of underlying tensions. There was a handful of regulations that had been handed down that weren't well received for obvious reasons. That all had to do with with, with stopping working men from from being able to take advantage of the situation and and make more money and secure more prosperity for their families. That was the underlying tension behind this thing. And so by the time you know by the time this tax collector uh, uh, came through. And try to disrespect. <laughs> there, there was already a lot of people were already on edge. Okay. And, and, and it wouldn't have taken much. And, and by the way, the whole thing of, of, of the state, you know, labor versus management. 
you know, I mentioned, you know, my other guy is Booker T. Washington. And I mentioned yeah. that, too, because, you know, in, in our political discussions, we're always talking about color. Right? We're always talking about race. We're always talking about, um, you know, you know, black versus, uh, excuse me, black versus white, as opposed to the real question, which has always been labor versus management. That's always been the real question. And now, so Booker T. Washington now came up and, and understood in, in the, in the decades after, um, America's failed experiment in fiat labor, right? That, that, that failed experiment, chattel slavery on the American continent, right? On the North American continent resulted in, in, in a tremendously destructive civil war. And so in, in, in the ashes of that failed experiment, when, you know, when, 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 the, when the wealthiest people in the society thought they could simply introduce fiat labor and, 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 um, and, and consolidate their commanding position, he came up and said, okay, now it's important for us to, for us to get into this, th- this market, for us to make ourselves productive human beings. Um, and, and, and that involve, and that's going to involve self improvement, right? And this was a, this was a dark skinned black man. In the in the South, right in the post bellum South, he had no illusions about color prejudice, but he said that, that, that we, uh, as Black folks, are going to improve our situation if we improve ourselves first. And you can read there's a book uh, called on character building that he wrote. It, it's a it's a compilation of his Sunday school addresses to his school to the Tuskegee Institute, which was a, a an industrial college for Black people in Alabama, and. You know, he talks all the time about the need for excellence. That's that, that's that's his whole thing. He's like excellence and character. Get up early. Get to the job early. Leave the job late. Make sure your appearance is is, is proper. Make sure your habits are good. Make sure you learn the latest techniques in whatever your trade is. If you prepare food, if you're a carpenter, if you what whatever you do. Keep up with the latest tools and techniques and methods in your chosen industry. He basically was basically saying, listen, these people are not going to, no one's going to legislate us into the mainstream. No one's going to pass a law saying people have to like us. We have to build ourselves and it's, and no one is going to come to say, no one's going to do that for us. So you can see right away why I, 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 I draw a very kind of strong line between people like uh, Booker T. Washington and, 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 and kind of the, the people who at, at one time or another in history decided to take their destiny into their own hands. And they, they didn't say, okay, someone come and save us. It's like, no, we're going to do this yeah. ourselves. So that's, yeah, that's, that's why I like those three. Yeah, it's <laughs> admirable. Um, they are all good principles to to live by what you said uh, i think one of the problems we've got with society now is that everything is geared towards uh big government yes, and expect and expecting um other people to do things for us we uh, that you know it, you could see for example you know something comes along like um covid19 and it's everyone's calling on the government uh, you know uh, lockdown look after us less about individual responsibility yes um and, and more about top down um this is what you must do yes well this is this is part of the imbalance that uh we talk about a lot in, in you know in the foundation of society is that we have um we are you know, suggest, and I talked about these three archetypes. I talk about the, the, the forge, which is the, the locus of practical application and work. I talk about the library, which is kind of institutions and history and knowledge and scholarship. And I talk about the tower, which is, which is, which is the moral imperative, the moral law, if you will, right? Yeah. And, and you, you have to have all those three things. And they have to be in some kind of balance, right? Because too much forge and not enough Library means you're not writing down what you do, so you can pass it down to to uh, your to, to posterity. But uh, uh, you know, too much library, not in the forge, means you you have your book smart, okay, but you can't actually do anything. You can't you, you you don't know how to work. And then too much of anything and not enough tower means that you're doing what you do without knowing why you do what you do. There is no moral impact. You're not you're going through the motions. You're not thinking about why, why, yeah. why. And so we, in your country and mine, we have this problem right now. We have not enough tower and we got too much library. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, we're, we're, you, you know what I'm saying? And we're all, yeah. and so, so many, I mean, think about the fact that so many of our top, 
I mean, I was, I was reading, someone was talking about the, many of the top officials in, I think it was either China or Russia, is that whatever you think about those nations and, and their mode of governance, the fact is a lot of their top guys went to engineering school. And a lot of our top guys went to law school. You see, and that's a problem, <laughs> you know, because because at yeah. the end of the day, an engineer is going to, at the end of the day, you might actually get something built with an engineer they know in how charge. To, they know how to do things. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And and we have seen, right, that that in your country and mine, like this, we're at the point where we, we seem not to be able to think seriously about a serious problem and then turn around and actually put the work in and build something. And that, that, yeah. that's a fundamental problem. It's, you know, we, 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 we lack the Ford spirit. And we lack the, the tower spirit. We, we haven't, we're not thinking enough about why, you know, everyone's talking about liberty and liberty is a fine thing, but, 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 but why should a man be free? You have to think about that because if, yeah. you, if you think, you know, what democracy is, is, or is not a good idea. Why, why, why is one man's vote no better than another? Why? You have to think about that. Because if you don't think about that, you're just going through the motions, and then and then anyone else with a, with a, with a, another bad idea can knock yours over, and so we might as well do this other bad thing. So yeah, yes, sir. okay. Um, now I'm not sure if we quite covered the last question, which is where would you go in history if you could go to any place? So we, we may have partly covered it already with the the last section, but is there anywhere else? Oh um, well, certainly, certainly, uh, um, Great Britain in the age of steam. Um, in the age of, of the, of the great kind of Victorian artificers, you know, I'm really a big fan of, of many of the people of that era. We're talking about, um, Brunel and Washington and people like that. Yes. I'm talking about Isambard Kingdom Brunel. That's yeah. one of my favorites. Um, you know, the, the citizen scientists of that era, um, Humphrey Davy, uh, Michael Faraday. Um, uh, you know, I just, uh, what's who's the guy who built the uh, uh, the the London sewer system? A uh, John uh, Basil Basil Jet? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah just just uh, I think that this is. I mean, look, the, the tool use, right, and engineering and design is a fundamentally human thing, and it's 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 one of the things that really sets us apart. And um, I, I I'm I really like that whole ethos. Of okay, we're going to we're going to use reason to solve these problems, um, and we're, and we're going to put the work in. Um, right now, we have there's there's a whole, a whole big debate about you know, climate issues, right? So called so called climate change or the climate catastrophe, whatever you want to call it. And you know what's interesting about this for for, for as much ink as has been spilled about that, what's interesting about this and what's very telling is that no one has ever decided, or it seems that very few people on the side of climate hysteria have decided to view this thing as an engineering challenge. They only see it as, as a, as a, as a chance to kind of morally lecture other people. They never see it as, Hey, let's, we can do more if we design new systems. Yeah. yeah that like, sums it up in a nutshell. Right. It's like, look, it's, let's it's just the, do, mor the, the yeah. moral lecturing That's over right. that. And so many things is what actually turns people off the issues in the 19th century. They'd have come up with solutions. That's right. They're like, okay, what about if we do this? What about if we, and, yeah. and and here's the thing about the, about solutions or about progress as such. And you know, talking about industrial uh, improvements and things like that. When you when you build a system to to solve a problem, that system creates other problems. Then you have to solve those problems, and so on and so on forever. That's as good as it gets in this world we have. You know, so. And and again, because we lack that, too, too many of our young people especially, lack that Ford spirit. They don't understand that. They don't understand what it means to that, that engineering is a trade-off, right? That n no one solution will solve everything. And that solutions will create follow-on problems that you then have to solve. And that progress is when the character of your problems improves. That's progress. It's not making all your problems go away. It, it, it's giving your children the luxury of solving better and higher order problems. But, but we're not going to get to that point unless we, unless we really start to kind of, I want to say deprogram our young people and get them to see this thing, not as just a threat environment and, and, and a chance to emote on social media about how terrible everything is, but that it's a great adventure to which they're called. Do you see what I'm saying? And and that's okay. kind of the that that was 
uh, yeah, we, we can complain about the Victorians. There's plenty to complain about about the Victorians already, okay? But fundamentally, okay, they saw th- th- this this notion of grappling with nature, okay, and, and with creating a, a, the, the, the built environment as a great adventure to which they were called. And I got to admire them for that. Yeah, I think we don't, as a society, talk enough anymore about that period of history. It's now past beyond living memory. Mm. My grandparents, uh, they were born in the 19th century. Um, and I used to talk to them and they, they talked, you know, about their family, about things that did happen in Victorian times. But that's kind of gone now. Mm. There's nobody sort of left alive to talk about that time. If you see where I'm coming from there. Yes. Although I think, I think it's, look, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know that that's the real reason because of course yeah. we, because look, when I was, when I was in uh, junior high school, we learned about Greek history, right? Yeah. We learned about the Phoenicians. We learned about the, we learned about the Roman empire. Okay. We know about the Punic wars. So, so I don't, I don't know that th- the fact that it's beyond living memory is what the problem is. I think the problem is that our, our whole relationship to history is out of order. Um, because, because we have, um, well, one, we, we've, we've normalized and elevated a certain kind of mental illness, um, s- certain, certain kinds of obsessions and, and ticks and, and, um, and obsessive behaviors, which are just not good for people. We have, we have, um, gone beyond understanding it or tolerating it as we've elevated it. We've elevated resentment. We've elevated yeah. pornographic. I, I think. I think maybe s- summing it up, the the real problem is that we've elevated pornographic thinking as opposed to holographic thinking, because you see the pornographic understanding of history. Uh, uh, when you think about the Victorians, all you think about is slavery. All you think about is Cecil Rhodes, and all you think about is colonialism, what have you, and yeah. and all those things were real. Don't get me wrong, but I'm saying that's pornographic. That's that's disembodying and magnifying one thing and making it everything as opposed to the holographic view of history which takes it all in turn and kind of integrates it into a whole picture so yeah and it's if people were to produce say television dramas now set in in the victorian era you know that they would have to highlight those issues that you've mentioned there because that is the 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 done way of doing Things. Well, they wouldn't. Well, well, um, well they, they you, wouldn't. They wouldn't have to do. If certain people did it, that's what they would do. But no one, yeah. if 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 you know, if I had a, if I had a couple million dollars in sofa cushions and I and I wrote a documentary, I'd do what I wanted to do. But it's it's that the, the yeah. people who actually happen to have all the money, that's how they think, um, because that's their agenda. So, yeah, it's like okay, we're going to make this program about I don't know the building of the railways or or yeah. or, uh, or the you know, the tea clippers or something like that. But we've got to make sure we lecture everybody about the bad things that people did in that era. Well, that's correct. That's correct. And, um, and this, yeah. And, and this is, this is by the way, uh, one, one of the side effects of, um, of, of us having lost sight of our own foundations, our own moral foundations, our mythical foundations, our religious foundations. Uh, we're just, it, it just, we have all these people, uh, many of them in, in, in the so-called cultural elite who are sitting on the budgets for movies and for school curricula and for all these different things. And they just, all they have is, is, is a, is a kind of a rotating collection of obsessions. That's it. They don't have a, they yeah. don't have a, a, they're not striving for an understanding. Um, they're just, and, and you can hear the way they talk. They talk about the narrative, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, you know, nar- narration is an instrument. <laughs> it's like the point is the point is to is the point is to come to an understanding. What are we trying to understand about ourselves, about our society? How how is it that we should reason about ourselves and e- each other? You know, and but 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 to these people, it's like, well, you change the narrative, the narrative, the narrative. The narrative is a tool. What is the work piece? <laughs> you know, it's like it's like it's like carpenters who want to talk about hammers all the time. It's like, well, when are you going to actually make something? We're going to cut wood and actually make a chair or a table. So, yeah, it's um, it, it's annoying. <laughs> it, it, it is annoying. Uh, uh, while the people that are in charge of these things continue to be in charge, it's it's 
difficult to see there being any great change. But, you know, I, I like to believe that the general public um, do have more sense in many cases than we often give them credit for. And a lot of people are seeing what's going on. And even if they're not doing anything about it, they're thinking about it, which 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 gives me some hope um, that perhaps we will at some point look back on this period of history as where the world collectively lost its mind and eventually we common sense prevailed. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you say that because um, that always reminds me of this quote from, I think it was Antonio Gramsci, who said that if I can destroy common sense, I can destroy society. Well, and, they're doing a pretty good job of it. Yes, sir. They? Yes, sir. So, you know, I think, look, I think it's our job. I think it's our job to to really to un- understand that no one's coming to save us um, and that we've got to we've got to put the work in ourselves. Common sense has been has certainly been damaged, if not destroyed. It's our job to rebuild it. Um, our institutions have been dis- destroyed or, or certainly uh, deeply compromised. It's our job to rebuild those, too. But we can't rebuild those. We can't we can't do any of the necessary rebuilding unless we first look to ourselves, right, and put our kind of internal affairs in order, right? And and, and the, the, the goal ultimately, right, is to have conservatives and liberals and whoever else who are the best that they can be. I want the best, most honest, most penny-pinching, most skeptical, most hard-headed conservatives, um, you know, th- that we can get. Just like I want, the, I want the best, the most honest, the most morally consistent um liberals right it's you know in other words we have to become better at reasoning irrespective of polit- uh, political affiliation so we can have better fights so we can have better quality arguments and and so we can turn around and build better things um on, on the back of that yeah i think that's a a great note to end on quite honestly that's uh, you've summed it up perfectly there so thank you for coming along to the podcast today Thank you for inviting me. This was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad. Um, if people want to find out more about your foundationist uh, group, um, where should they go? They should go to www.futurad.io. Um, they can also look up uh, Carbon Mike. I have, I have a YouTube channel um, uh, that I don't update as often as I should, but uh, you can you can find some of my content there. Um, you can you can find me on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is Future Radio Cast, and you can also uh, look up some of my uh, the, the people in, in my foundationist uh, foundationist circle who do great work: uh, Danny Duran and the Infinite Jigsaw Podcast, um, Seb Abacasis and the Not the BBC Podcast, um, and I've even had a couple of conversations with Father um, Father Jamie Franklin. Uh, who does the Irreverend podcast. So we're, we're, we're starting to get the word out. Yeah, and I know all those people and uh, could definitely vouch for them. I've been on Danny's podcast as well. Which oh, was man, Danny's, Danny's, Danny's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant, fantastic. Well, I'll put all those in the show notes as well. So that's about it. Thanks very much for coming along. Thanks, brother. I really appreciate it. Yep, and we'll see you all again soon. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.